Are you curious about what the difference is between computational literacies and computational thinking? Or how literacy and cultural imperialism relate to power in education? Or maybe you want to hear a discussion on how programming languages might actually impact identity and identity development. Or simply hear two people nerd out on the intersections of music and computer science. If any of those topics and more interest you, make sure you stick around for this interview with Michael Horn. And if you want to find more interviews like this, make sure you visit jaredaleary.com, where there are hundreds of more podcast episodes, as well as a ton of free computer science education resources. But before you go diving into all that, we will begin this episode with an introduction by Michael. Hey everyone, my name is Mike. I'm a professor at Northwestern University in the Chicago area, and I have this weird joint appointment in computer science and in our school of education and a learning sciences program, which means that I'm kind of kind of straddling two two different worlds and thinking about problems not quite from a CS perspective and not quite from an education perspective and trying to do a little bit of both. Recently, my work has really been kind of at the intersection of the creation of digital music and Python coding and sort of thinking about all of the kind of educational affordances that, that fall out of that intersection. So that's what a lot of my students and I have been kind of thinking about recently. I'm really curious. I, none of my professors ever had the dual appointment. Does that mean dual amount of work, like double the amount that you have to do? Or? <laughs> <laughs> if you do it right, it means that you can kind of get away with sort of saying, oh, I'm doing, you know, I'm doing service work for school of education. So I, I can't, I don't have much extra bandwidth right now. And, <laughs> and actually, you know, my people in charge of me, like deans and stuff, have, have been really great and really supportive in terms of making that, that work. Can you tell me the story of how you got interested in designing innovative learning experiences? I kind of fell in love with computer science as like a seventh grader a long time ago on, on like Apple IIs. But it was kind of like one of those things where, you know, when you... you you discover something, you're like, "Whoa, this is this is like I just didn't realize that I was re really, really excited about this stuff, you know." Mm -hmm. And I just loved tinkering. I had no idea what I was doing, so a lot of it was just self-taught, kind of. And you know, so I, I went college, did computer science, and I was doing a lot of teaching assistant work as an undergrad. But when I graduated, I kind of was like, "I, I want to go into educational technology as a career." Worked for a startup company, doing like kind of online curriculum products and sort of adventure learning kinds of things, and that was great. For a couple of years, but then I was realizing like we're building curriculum products, we're building products for teachers, but our sales team is selling to districts at best and states at worst, right? Like so it's like we're gonna sell to the entire state of Texas our curriculum product. And I'm like, you know what? I have since I've been at this company, I've never seen the inside of a classroom. Mm. Like I've never seen a teacher actually using anything that we're doing. Mm. And that got me you know, more and more, I was like, man, I, I just feel like I'm missing, you know, something. So that was kind of the impetus to go back to grad school. But for the GRE, got rejected from like 20 places and, you know, eventually ended up at, at Tufts University where it did, did a dissertation. And that was kind of like really fun place to be at that time. And kind of was just like gotten, I don't know, just like it was like, you know, things started to click, really was interested in computational literacy as a, as a kind of direction for how can we use human computer interaction design as a tool for advancing computational literacy. And, and that was kind of how that got started. So you mentioned computational literacy. What does that mean to you? I think computational literacy is a very important term and it's really misunderstood. And I'm going to go into a little detail here because I think, it's, I think it's actually really important. But so, you know, the conversation has really been about computational thinking. Okay, that term thinking, and that's where a lot of the energy's been. Mm -hmm. And I sort of think of computational literacy as a much broader conceptualization of, of computational thinking. It sort of encompasses computational thinking. But so the reasons are like a literacy is something that is developmental. It involves culture, it involves ways of thinking, and it involves identity. So like these are the, the pieces that are really interesting for me. So I can like, like a quick example. You know the song, uh, Five Little Ducks Went Out to Play? Mm -mm. Okay. Five little ducks went out to play over the hills and far away. Mama duck called quack, 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 and only four little ducks came back. And then the song repeats. The next time you go through the song, there's three ducks and two ducks and then one duck and then like no ducks come back and the mom's really sad. And then you sing the verse one more time and then all the, the ducks come back. Mm -hmm. so I sing that song to little kids, like or my, my sons and daughters, right? And like, why am I singing that song? And this is like an example of a culturally embedded literacy activity. So from like our earliest ages, like adults and children, like through these sort of cultural forms of like songs and letters and, you know, refrigerator magnet letters, like we are building literacy, reading storybooks, right? Like all of these things like are building literacy, building numeracy 
If you come from a musical family, your interactions with your parents are probably very like musical in nature. Like you probably have a lot of musical memories with, I don't know about you in particular, but like that sort of music as a literacy is sort of very sort of much culturally conveyed. Like sure, schools have a art to play, but there's like literacy takes a long time to develop. It has profound implications for our identity. So we become like a literate person and like that's part of our identity. And once we are, once we have literacy, it shapes the way we think in profound ways. It shapes the kind of ideas we have. It shapes the language that we use to think about ideas. When we're thinking about computational thinking, I think we think of things like hour of code, right? It's sort of like, or like you have to have a CS graduation requirement to get out of a Chicago public high school, right? And when I think about literacy, I think about a much, much longer trajectory and and direction. And so like a lot of these ideas for me are shaped by uh, people like Andy DeSessa and um, Annette V are two scholars that I, I've been, you know, reading a lot of that have influenced my thinking there. So when, when I'm thinking about computation as a literacy, I think about it in those terms, like it's not just a one and done our code kind of thing. It, it, it's something that happens over a long period of time. And I don't think it's culturally embedded right now. And I'm really curious mm -hmm. about like, how do we get to the like sort of the five little ducks song version of, of computational literacy? Full disclaimer, I'm not a huge fan of computational thinking and the way that it's presented. One, there's no unified definition of it. Nobody knows what they're talking about when they say computational thinking because everybody assumes their own other completely different definition of it. The first time that I was really introduced to the idea of computational literacy literacies was in a paper is by Kafai and Proctor. So it's called A Revaluation of Computational Thinking in K-12 Education moving toward computational literacies. And that's episode 111. I actually unpack that in this podcast. And I really enjoyed the way that they described it in terms of it like being like a thing that you do. It's much more active. And I really appreciate your description of literacy taking a long period of time is not just a one and done. I often see a lot of districts when they engage in computational thinking in particular, they they look at it and go, all right, well, I checked off that I just did pattern recognition. I won't need to do that until next semester. Right. And it's like, right. no, like right. if if this is actually conceived of as a literacy or even a skill, like if I'm I'm very slowly learning Japanese and if I spent an hour, one semester or one year trying to learn Japanese, would I ever be able to learn how to read, write, speak Japanese? Right. No, never. It's like not no, going to happen. Never. And so yeah. I really like your, your framing of computational literacies, but I'm curious, like, what do you wish more educators understood about your framing of computational literacies? That's a great question. And I, and I should also say, like, you know, I don't think that becoming computationally literate is as difficult as, say, learning Japanese, right? Like, I think <laughs> that it's, a, it, Andy DeSessa calls it like a technical literacy, which is something like, maybe like an, like algebra is like another example that he really likes to hold up as a technical literacy. It's something that once you kind of learn algebra and you can start thinking in these ways, like it, like I think a lot of people have the experience of doing algebra and they and it sort of felt like, wow, that really actually changed the way I think about a lot of things. I have to say, like, I'm actually a big fan of a lot of the direction that people who are designing the high school curriculum are thinking about, or even even the K-8 curriculum are really thinking about, you know, this as a long game, as, as something that can be integrated meaningfully with other subjects. Mm. And I think that that's coming along slowly. But, you know, I think that would be my kind of biggest takeaway for for me, it's like a, being literate means that I can engage in other kinds of things using that language as a tool, mm. right? So, so it becomes a for me, it becomes a tool to think about music, or it becomes a tool to think about like for Andy DeSessa, it's a tool to think about physics. Or, or there's a really brilliant paper by Bruce Sharens. This is an older paper, but it's kind of like it's, it's sort of like asking this really cool what if question, like what if we took out equations out of learning physics in the intro physics class at an undergraduate level and instead used coding what would the implications of that be and and you know he really kind of takes a deep dive into that world and and it's not like a direct actionable thing but it's just more of a shift in vantage point and like kind of how we think about the role of, of coding and computation in in its relationship to other subjects and other ways of being and that we don't have to like do it all like it's okay you know we do an like i don't mind doing an hour of code right like it is a it's an introduction it like yeah. And I don't have to like accomplish the whole field. But, you know, I do think you're right. Like it, it does help address this kind of like check mark mentality that like, oh, we did. Right. We did this topic. So we're, we're done. Right. right. You know, and, and, and that's it. Yeah. And the, the framing of you mentioned using it as a tool. 
uh, illiteracy involves not just reading, but also writing. So not just using, but also creating. And so that idea is a very key distinction from what I see people describing as computational thinking, where it's just like, oh, well, you're thinking about something. You might be solving a problem, but you might not be. You might not be creating thing. You might not be creating or reading or doing anything. You're just thinking. But literacies might involve more than that. Right. Totally. So here's here's the other piece is like I don't think actually computational literacy. Well, like, you know, when I when I went through, I became a professional software engineer. And for me, that like I do think I, I had sort of a literacy in computation, but I don't think it's fully there yet. Like we don't have we're getting there, but we don't have like say genres of computational literacy. We're not using computational literacy to mm. to communicate. The cool thing is like once you start thinking about things as literacy, all sorts of implications start to, to fall out of that. Yeah. One of my favorite is um, like Annette V. She has this this wonderful book from 2017, and she talks about medieval France as a literate society. Like they, if you wanted to buy land in medieval France, if you wanted to get married, if you wanted to, you know, pay your taxes, you had to have some sort of written document. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like the the society was dependent on reading and writing documents, but the the portion of literate people in that society was very low. So you had a literate society or society that was dependent on literacy and a population that is largely illiterate. And what she sort of says there is like, then you can see how literacy is connected to power in that society. And so I think that reflection on modern day society is really interesting. Because if you think about like, we, like it's hard to sort of dispute that computation is a literacy of power in society right now, right? Like Everything we do in some ways depends on software that somebody wrote. But the proportion of the population that is like computational literate is like super small. Like that that analogy is really interesting. It has limitations. Like it's not a perfect analogy, but I think, you know, th those are the kinds of things that you start to wonder about when you think of computation as literacy. Yeah, my mind is, is spinning right now. Like the idea of thinking of what would different genres be of computational literacy, like that is, has really got me thinking. But even what you're just talking about, like, yeah, there is a, a lot of power if you are literate and are able to use this form of literacy in society. And what is I find kind of fascinating is that there are people in power, like Congress, who are not literate in this, and they are in a position of power, but they don't have this kind of power. So it's, it's fascinating seeing them in their the TikTok ban discussions. Yeah, and they have no clue what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like, does TikTok connect to Wi-Fi? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, I don't understand. So the other really cool thing that Annette B does, this book really changed my thinking in so many ways. Is she's like, the, the problem is, like, if I say I am computationally literate, like, do you, do you think of yourself as computationally literate? Yeah, it depends on how you think of computational literacy. But yeah, I mean, like, there's the using the tools, like computers, there's the, like, there's a continuum of it. Uh, there's also being able to program it. Like I can go from like one end to the other and back and forth, etc. So in different ways, I am literate. So like if you had to write a Python script to pull down some data, like metadata on like, say, you know, I don't know, whatever you're interested in, like you could probably figure out how to do that. Yeah, like I haven't used Python, but because I have used like C++, Swift, Java, JavaScript, etc., like I can transfer the syntax over and go, okay, I can figure this out. This is what I would need to do. Yeah. One of my problems with computational literacy is that it's also very imprecise in the same way that computational thinking is. And like that, that kind of bugs me. But one of the things that Anit V did that, that, you know, she's like, basically, when we start calling ourselves computationally literate, we have just inadvertently called a whole bunch of people computationally illiterate. And to call someone illiterate is attaches stigma to that person. Mm. And, and so there's like a moral, like, so once education system, like, here's where the danger comes in. It's like an education system says, okay, we're going to, we're going to call everything computational literacy. Well, then it's sort of like there you start to attach these moral value judgments to people who don't have that like literacy. Like to call somebody illiterate is a moral judgment mm. on them in many ways, even if we don't intend it that way. Like I think yeah. that, that and then, so then you start to think about, well, hey, like we're talking about literacy. Like you have to remember that like as much as literacy has been like a tool of empowerment for people, it has been a tool of oppression in exactly as much, you know, so like who gets to decide what counts as literacy? Yep. Who do we? Who gets access to the literacy? Who gets denied? Whose forms of literacy are rep 
oppressed or marginalized, you know, literacy can be a tool of disenfranchisement. So it's like in the research we're doing, we're thinking about a lot of those like kind of those tensions, I think, are really, are really everywhere when you once you start to think about it. Yeah. And you know, let's let's double click on that. Like, I'm happy to dive into that. Like, I've done podcast episodes. We've unpacked like Bordeaux in relation to like cultural capital in education and just learning in general. Like I've interviewed Kimberly Scott and we've talked about this. Like Joyce McCall has talked about it. Like most of these discussions have been around race in particular, but like happy to talk about just like equity at large. Like I think it's very important to discuss that. So if we can talk about how does computational relate to that or even just equity in in relation to CS education, etc. Like let's do it. I have a PhD student Isaiah Wallace, who's who's about to graduate, so he should be he should be Dr. Wallace in about a month or two here if all goes well. And he's really been thinking hard about this, you know, this particular issue. He initially started out as an electrical engineer and then switched over to computer science and then really sort of fell into this, you know, sort of world of computer science and education, although I think he wouldn't call himself in that realm because he really wants to push beyond formal education. Mm-hmm. And so he and he came up as a, a street dancer in Philadelphia. So like he was immersed in a community of people where, you know, they had competitions, but they had mentoring structures. There was like, it was a real community of practice of people who learned how to do, how to engage in dance. And so he's really been trying to think about applying that kind of experience to out of school computer science and sort of computational literacy. Halby survey. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what it is, is it's been going on forever. It's been going on for, since the seventies. They, they survey colleges and universities in North America. So they'll like just write to all of the department heads of all computer science, computer engineering departments in Canada and the United States and just be like, tell us about who's graduating, who's getting degrees, who's entering PhD programs, who's leaving PhD programs. And it's like kind of depressing to go back and look at the historical data and how things have changed in computer science as a field over 40 years, right? And you see very, very slow but steady progression of women in the field. They're still uh, very much under representation, Mm -hmm. but there's been slow and steady progress. So at a minimum, you're like, okay, at least I'm seeing, I'm seeing growth. I'm seeing change. If you look at Black students who enter PhD programs, Black students who enter master's programs, undergraduate degree programs, it has been flat for, for pretty much since the 70s. And like that just lack of change is super depressing. But I also think sort of super indicative of the way the cultural nature of the field right now as it is. Um, and so... Isaiah is really thinking about like, okay, why aren't we seeing this change and reflecting on his own experience mm-hmm. as a black man in the field of computer science. And like, he would be actually a really fascinating person if you want to have a really fascinating podcast, like chat with Isaiah about this. But yeah, happy to. he's been, you know, kind of thinking about like, okay, I, I didn't learn dance in a school. I learned it in sort of like in my own cultural context in a sort of almost like an underground community of dancers. And he's like saying, well, why can't we have that in computer science? Like, why can't, like he had this term he called street coding. Like, why can't we have people who are just out on, you know, like using code for self-expression, like music or dance or poetry? Like, why is it? And that if you... If you're not paying attention to culture and processes of enculturation that fall outside of formal academic settings, you're you're missing the the point, right? And 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 this goes back to the literacy thing. Like I think that there's a certain degree of enculturation that happens for people who that you know that parents and children engage in that prepares them for academic degree programs. Like that's just the way it is. And yeah. so his his focus is like, how do we start to imagine sort of underground computing cultures that are for him located in like sort of the black American experience. But I think you could imagine this in, in, in lots of different contexts. And how do you encourage and grow that kind of thing that's completely outside of formal school settings. And so he's really thinking about the long game and, and kind of thinking about computational enculturation. In the unpacking sc- scholarship episodes, I like to share like lingering questions and thoughts at the end of the episode. Like here's something that just kind of popped into my head while reading this. I forget which paper it was, but one of them, I was wondering out loud, at what point is it a form of like, I don't know, epistemological or ontological or axiological colonization? So colonizing ways of knowing, being, valuing, etc. when we look at some of that data. And so the thing that like really just randomly popped in my head one day was, well, there likely are not a lot of Amish people who are getting degrees in computer science. If we are trying to increase that percentage, is that then a form of colonization in terms of changing the ways of being and valuing, et cetera? 
And at what point does that happen with other cultures other than that a very extreme example right there? Yeah. And yeah. so some of that has been talked about with like, well, why are certain genders in fields and not in others, et cetera? And, and yeah, I don't know. That's just kind of me thinking out loud. Like, it's a fascinating, there's so many different intersectional things and cultural things to consider, like when it comes to any kind of data like that. Totally. And so, and, and yeah, this is going back to Andy DeSessa, like he was really upset with the term computational thinking. And part of the reason was he felt that, and, and Annette V talks about this too, is that, that like we tend to equate computational literacy with computer science as a field. Mm -hmm. And he calls this kind of like a cultural imperialism where Mm -hmm. computer science it's a scientific discipline it values it's an engineering discipline it values efficiency and correctness and writing neat and tidy comments and and you know being all of these things that go along with kind of scientific disciplines and but you know that's not what i was that's not why i fell in love with coding right like i fell in love with coding for the craft of it for the creative part of it like and and it kind of this idea of like well do we if we started to have different genres of computational literacy then this kind of your point about like okay well who gets to own who gets to decide and are we just like inviting you know are we trying to like we're trying to invite other people into our dominant culture Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying like, maybe, maybe we should be open to people, you know, reinventing computational literacy ideas on their own terms. And so we've, we've also been kind of playing around with ideas of subversive literacy. So if you like, like I tend to think of like the, the birth of hip hop is kind of like a subversion of dominant forms of literacy, dominant musical paradigms, dominant paradigms of dance. It was sort of rejecting the act, like the academy and saying like, you know what, we're, we're just going to reinvent this on our own terms. Right. And Mm -hmm. I think you look at you look at jazz, you look at blues, like a lot of the sort of musical genres that grew out of the Black American experience. I think that those are really, really interesting examples of subversions of literacy to sort of reclaim power, reclaim identity. And like, what would a subversion of computational literacy look like mm -hmm. that sort of rejects the sort of the, the cultural imperialism of like computer science? These are Andy DeSessa's terminology. But so I think your your example, like that's what it makes me think about. Yeah, that's interesting. I I really like that. I'm I'm kind of curious what your genre of computer science was that got you interested in it. So like for myself, it would be like game development. Like that was something that I was interested in. Yeah, I mean I, I <laughs> I'm very old, you know, I learned on an Apple IIe like in basic and but it was the kind of thing where nobody was telling me what was good or bad code like it was just right. and and like I wanted to recreate and then it was like Turbo Pascal like I'm really old and but it's like I wanted to make video games like my parents didn't have a lot of money we didn't have like you know video game console in our house so it's like I want to make my own version of these games and and the code was terrible like it was <laughs> just awful right like but I didn't know any better and no one was telling me like no that's wrong you know right. and I would spend Four hours and hours and hours into that for, for those reasons. Yeah, I, I say that because I, I think it's important to think of context in the classroom and like how you can explore different interests. So like you're mentioning like genres. When I was in the K-8 coding classes that I taught, there were kids who really wanted to make games. There were some kids who really wanted to make stories. There are others who wanted to make music or art and animation. Like having those different genres as ways to express oneself or explore one's interests, it was a huge part of what I tried to focus on in the classroom and in the curriculum that I developed in professional development, et cetera. And to be honest, like that's the thing I've been really, you know, that really encourages me about the current state of CS education is that I do think that the tendency has been to, I'm not going to teach you like the AP CS curriculum and force you to learn how to, you know, write Pascal or Python or whatever it is. It's been about highlighting the ways in which coding can be used in creative domains and, and on lots of different creative domains from video games to robotics to, to music to art to, you know. Yeah, it's been nice. Like when I was in high school, the, it was the very first year, my junior year, that they offered APCS, and it was when it was C++, and until that, I had nothing. So to see that kindergartners now have an option in some districts from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, so for 13 years, they can explore different platforms, different languages, etc. When they get into high school, they could go into app development, game development, they could do like CS discoveries, uh, APCS, all sorts of different ideas. It's, it's nice having many different pathways for people to explore. And I think like going back to the the equity discussion, like I'm to be clear, I'm definitely an advocate for representation, et cetera, but I also am like cautious with like the colonization side of things. But the fact that we have these different paths for people to take, like I want to make something that's fun versus I want to make something that helps people. 
The fact that those two different branches might exist within the same class or in different classes, I think is fantastic. That is really fantastic. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's unfortunate that you had to learn C++ as your first language. (laughs) That's a separate conversation. Okay, well, let's get nerdy for a second. So one of the the thoughts that I had is, so the, the kids that I work with from fourth grade through eighth grade, some of them chose to work with Ruby as their language in Sonic Ply. And they really enjoyed creating with that. But one of the the questions that I kind of had that I never really got an answer for was, how are they going to feel when they transfer from a higher level language to a lower level language versus going from lower to higher? Because for myself, having learned the syntax nightmare that was C++, it made it so when I got to like something like Ruby, I was like, wow, this is super easy. Everything, this is like super simple. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. going the other direction, I wonder if it'd be even more confusing. Yeah. This is one where I feel like people like David Weintraub are really kind of trying to push to, to really understand. Mark Gisdial, too, I think is, is thinking a lot about like, is it the language? Is it the applications? Like, where do we want to be spending our time? Also in, in formal education settings, like if the point is not CS for its own sake, but CS or something else that we're doing like do you really want to do you really want to spend all your time learning you know syntax of even even like a python like language right yeah so mark was on episode 86 and andreas stefik was on episode 27 and what was fascinating about that conversation with andreas is he mentioned a a study that they did where they used a placebo language that had random characters to see if a programming language did better or worse than the placebo and some of them did worse <laughs> Just like random collection of characters for like a for loop or for whatever. That's no good. <laughs> really funny. I don't know the answer to this. I and mean, like, I, I thought a little bit about it. It hasn't been really been my main kind of like emphasis. Well, and Mark Gustav might disagree with me here, but I worry a little bit about like that the languages condescend to kids as they get older when, when it's kind of drag and drop. Hmm. A little bit that if we're teaching high school students scratch, and I, I want to be cautious here because like I don't have the data. Like, so that this is like I'm just as. Just me like wondering. We've been working with Python with fifth grade students for a while now and it and it works. You know, some some kids are still learning how to type. Some kids don't know how to copy paste. You know, so there are real it's much slower for them. Yep. But there are lots of fifth graders who, you know, are flying, yep. right? And they're ready. You know, so, and they've been doing Scratch or Tinker or Code.org for years now and they're ready. But this is kind of like the, the literacy as identity sort of thing where it's like there are communities where it's sort of like the things that look really technical and complex is like part of the identity experience yep. that like, if you like audio engineers, I think are, you know, they've got their, you know, their Ableton live, you know, DAWs up and there's like, that's what I'm recording on. <laughs> 10 billion LEDs flashing, you know, like cables everywhere. Like, and, and that's kind of like a badge of honor. Like it is, you know, to be taken seriously as an audio engineer, you sort of give off this like, and the, the truth is you probably don't need all that visual complexity like to do a good job with it. Right. So I, I kind of wonder about the, the identity related aspects of that. I think we, we tend to want to not intimidate students with languages that feel like, you know, too technical and complex. But I there I think there's a flip side in that I think some students really want to have that sort of that visual image. <laughs> it's like it's all like about appearances, but I think in some ways like appearances and identity, you know, like it's it's very important, right? Like that the tools that I use are part of my identity. And so anyway, th- those are things I wonder about. I don't have any answers. Or- I, that's a, a great wonderment. I mean, especially in middle school and high school, there's uh, insecurity is something that you really have to consider when working with kids because they don't want to be perceived as uncool or lesser than their peers or the groups they want to associate with. Right. So if they're using a language that they might consider like a quote baby language, like a uh, block based, right. they might have lower social status than if they're using something that is considered to be more professional and less of a baby language. Right. Even though it might be able to do the same thing or be easier, there is that like social status involved with it. So I think that's an important thing to consider. Yeah. Which is, again is like why I focused on having multiple platforms, multiple languages, you pick which one you want. And it's really easy, really, really easy, I think, to, to genderize students to sort of say like, you know, girls are not going to like the Ableton Live kind of experience that, you know, they want, you know, like we don't, it's not that explicit or overt, but there are much more subtle ways in which we act that I think, you know, genderize the experience, racialize the experience. I think we're studying languages from a very cognitive perspective, like what is, how does this help us learn? What's the right trajectory, you know, like to sort of make the learning 
curve as smooth as possible, mm-hmm. as opposed to thinking about like languages from an identity perspective and in a you know sort of an affective perspective. How do I feel? Like how does this? Pre- how do I present when I'm sort of seen? You know, coding with this language. That's interesting. Does that inform your work with what you've done with TunePad? Yes, very much. Like we made a lot of aesthetic decisions in TunePad where we're, we're trying to thread a needle between we want something that's very easy to learn, but we want it to have the appearance of, you know, like kind of has an appearance of a professional music production environment. And, it, you know, like choosing like what color scheme do you use for your IDE, right? Like what, what does your text editor look like? Yep. Does it have the dark background, you know, with the candy coated color syntax or does it have, you know, a light background? And, you know, we, we put a lot of like those kinds of decisions, I think, are really important. And we, I, to be honest, like we don't have good data behind like whether those are the right decisions or not. So it's kind of it's really hard to study that. But maybe that's something we should study. <laughs> <laughs> there is an aesthetic that we wanted to go around coding, you know, in relation to music that, that we were trying to see. And then the, the other side of that is like we wanted be easy easy enough to learn so that people aren't completely thrown off guard because there's like these two literacies that we're trying to pursue simultaneously like there's right. the computational literacy which is really technical and difficult musical literacy which is really technical and difficult and we're asking people to do both at the same time right so one way to think about it is like well that's going to be twice as hard as just teaching music on its own or coding on its own and so kind of our argument is like it may seem like it's twice as hard but we actually like teaching them together makes both easier so we actually like at least that's the sort of hypothesis that we're we're running with that it, coding gives you a, a really interesting language to think about music and the algorithmic nature of music and the mathematical nature of music and structural nature of music and it breaks through like hundreds and hundreds of years of like really confusing music terminology at least if you're looking at like western traditions like western music notation is screwed up it's just like a disaster right like it's German, Italian, French, English, all mangled together with these like weird, redundant terminology. Like, why is C sharp the same thing as like D flat? And like, you know, and and the chord names like are a disaster. You know, like, I, sorry, I, I don't want to offend any music people out there, but it, <laughs> it's really, it's really, I mean, it's really awful. And so, code is this like kind of really cool. Well. Okay, this is my just opinions, right? Like, so like it feels like a, a restructuration of of music terminology. It's a new way to think about music, and then sort of like music really is a like a domain where like the cool parts about what you can do with code start to shine through in like really interesting ways. At least, at least that's what we're going for. Let's take a step back for a second. If you were in an elevator and you're introducing yourself, and you're like, "Oh, I work on this thing called TunePad." And they're like, oh, what is TunePad? I've never heard of it. What would your response be for that? TunePad is a, is a free online platform that you can use to create digital music using Python coding language as a programming language as the, the tool that you create digital music with. We use it to teach kids about music and music theory. But, but oftentimes we spell that as teaching Python coding because that's what people care about right now. It's just unfortunate. <laughs> now it, that... We've established some context because I realize I have context because I've like looked at the website and whatnot, but somebody who's like new might not. Might be like, I've never heard of this. What is this? Going back to your point about like the the problems with Western staff notation, it is very limited on the data that it actually conveys to a performer. The performer has to be able to expand upon the notes, not just looking at the dynamics, but also looking at timbre, thinking about it in relation to the acoustic environment in which you're performing in, the audience you're working with. Oh, there's so many factors like that has been addressed to an extent by digital audio workstations, DAWs, like you mentioned, Ableton Live, GarageBand is a very like user friendly one, etc. Where you have this granular control as a producer, composer, etc. to be able to shape the timbre, the acoustic characteristics of the sound. That's something you can't get by just putting a note on a staff. So there's a lot of data missing from there. When you add in that layer of code from myself, it expands some opportunities that you would not have just performing with an acoustic instrument, in particular, something called aleatoric music. So like aleatoric music is more chance based. So like myself, I wrote out a drum kit that plays an infinite number of drum grooves and fills. And I don't know what it's going to sound like until I get it another seed and then it'll just play forever. That is a, a, like that integration of music and CS. What was the term aleatoric? Mm-hmm. 
Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, so like an example is like roll a dice and then that'll tell you what chord to play kind of a thing. It's a whole genre that's been going on for quite some time, but it, it's fascinating. But that connection of CS and music, like I really enjoy exploring those intersections where you can't have one without the other. Like I mentioned before we started recording, like my dissertation, like chip tunes, etc. I think that intersection is fascinating. Can I do a little musical demo? Mm-hmm. That, that I think is exactly what, what I really, like one of the dimensions of like, you know, coding that comes through. Let me try playing like a sampling. So th- this is like very like just for playing four chords, right? Like there's no, mm-hmm. there's no randomness or, you know, but, but even like how you describe chords, I think is actually kind of interesting yeah, when you start to describe chords and mathematical like relationships and and you know if it's a ma- it's a if it's a major triad it has exactly the same numerical pattern no matter what the root note is and like that's a really different way of thinking about chords than i think we're used to but in this one like there's like a, just sort of a basic sort of bad bunny and started inspired beat where you have just like a rhythmic pattern that uses a drum machine which is kind of like the signature style Okay, so that's like your 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 sort of main beat. But then like oh and then sort of sort of I think another sort of bad bunny signature style is like to kind of have like sort of trap sounding hi hats that kind of layer in on top of that. So like So those are your like your hi hats and that's just a bunch of python for loops mm-hmm. and you, you can't see it but like you know the kind of breaking down hi hat patterns is like that is an algorithmic structure in the music and so we don't usually think about it that way but like it's a really really good example of like why you might want for loops and like the flexibility that for loops give you in terms of changing the duration of notes the number of notes and the pitch of notes and it's really easy to experiment with different patterns you know and much of the way that like i think modern DAWs let you do but it's kind of like a, a cool language to do that with but then what you were talking about with aleatoric music like this using randomness to just sort of say like i want to randomly sprinkle in you know some some claps into that main beat pattern and then you play all three of those together or like you can just play the whole thing together and like and you know it's that kind of playing with randomness that like layers in with sort of like well-established beat patterns it's like really easy to express in a in a in a length and like a language like python and it's really hard to express with sheet music right so thank you for indulging that <laughs> always happy to talk about music and cs so how do you envision students and teachers using that like cs teachers versus like music educators yeah so we've had very little success getting music educators to, to buy into this <laughs> a lot of them are uh, a bit uh, old in their ways <laughs> in their thinking we just it was br- like just the other day we were working in an art classroom and the art teacher is like oh you should meet our music teacher and she brought us over and introduced us to the music teacher and like that was the first time i really like clicked with a music teacher in a music classroom and we were like okay this is an exciting you know sort of mashup of these two worlds hmm. but i think it's been it's been really really hard to get to get music teachers to, to work with us and i can understand why I, can, I think it makes sense what what are their rationales for it i mean i i think this is true of any teacher that like their jobs are really really hard and if you're a music teacher, you're probably, you know, working with hundreds of kids on a yeah. given day. I mean, you know this better than I do, I'm sure. And so it's like even like remembering kids' names and getting them to like engage. It's like you, your your challenges are substantial, yeah. and you're trying to build a love of music, you know, for kids, and like that is your priority, and rightfully so, right? Like, so if somebody's like, you know, we could do Python coding and music, and it's like, uh, like I don't know who you are, I don't trust you, <laughs> I don't, I don't see the value in this beyond what we're already doing, like. These are real instruments. I mean, I think that there's something to be said for like playing real instruments and like, you know, exploring the real timbre of like, you know, percussion or whatever it is that you're learning. So I think it's it's a really hard sell. What about music technology teachers? Like there's not as many of them, but yeah, uh, because they might be teaching with GarageBand or Pro Tools or whatever. Yeah. And a lot of them are. And I think it's been kind of it is kind of like trust issues. Like I think if a colleague says, oh, you have to check out this thing like, oh, so I should shout out your sketch here. like. And Sonic Pi are the, the the two other big players kind mm-hmm. of in this. So we 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 got started in collaboration with EarSketch. So it's like this was like kind of meant to be an extension of the EarSketch ecosystem. And Sonic Pi was very much an inspiration for us. You know, we we saw some limitations of Sonic Pi, but but yeah, I think if a if a 
colleague comes to you and says, oh, hey, like you're using GarageBand. Have you seen this thing called TunePad? And, you know, here's all this curriculum and you should try it out. Like, I think that that you trust your colleague more than, than a researcher who's like saying, do you want to try out my experimental thing? You know, and so I think some of it is just a matter of like time and exposure and like if, if people see the platform and they like it. And, and like that's our goal is that it spreads by word of mouth and that people get excited about it. But, you know, it's I think it's still, I don't know if this is going to work, right? Like we, we've had a lot of success with it. We enjoy teaching it. Like we've seen students react to it, but none of these platforms are perfect. And, you know, does this serve a real need for real teachers and real students is like, I think that's the, that's the real question. And I don't, you know, I don't pretend to know the answer. I do think that there has been a bit of a history with the arts in general and other domains kind of coming in as colonizers. And I'm not saying that that's what's happening, but mm. there have been studies, even when it comes to the intersection of music and CS, where like the explicit goal in the abstract is the purpose of this is to increase enrollment numbers in computer science courses. Totally. So we're going to do this thing. Yeah. And so there, there is that skepticism, even for those who are like really into music technology and like can see the value in it. It, it can come across mm -hmm. uh, as subservient depending on how things are framed. Totally. But I do like your point that like if it's introduced from a colleague, that might be less scary than like that history of outsider coming in as researcher trying to show me what to do exactly right and i think there's a version of this narrative that i don't espouse which is like we want to get more kids into computer science and the way we do that is you know dress it up in something fun like music or video games <laughs> right. and that way they'll they'll you know get excited about computer science because we're kind of almost like tricking them into the it's the sort of classic chocolate covered broccoli <laughs> you know narrative which you know i definitely am not don't agree with um and i've really been the more I get into this, the more I'm thinking like, this is a really interesting way to think about music education. So music education, right? Like I learned music. I learned how to play viola starting in middle school. I learned by the Suzuki method and it was torture, right? Like it was like play twinkle, twinkle, little star until your fingers bleed. Literally. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't mean that that's like all music education. And I don't even think it's all Suzuki method applications, but the way that Suzuki method was applied in my case was just rote practice, right? And I never, I never really got an appreciation for how music works. I never got to appreciate music as a literature. Like I could sort of think about it, have my own ideas and reaction to a piece of music. It was just like, shut up and play Midas Midorsky, like, 10,000 times because we're performing it at the end of the, you know, the end of the quarter. I never made any of my own music with that instrument. That's an important point for people to consider. Like for those who have not been in a music class as a student or as a teacher, like there's an assumption, oh, well, you're creating music. It's like, no, you're recreating somebody else's music that they wrote and you are performing it the exact same way as everyone else. There's very little expressiveness in those kinds of classes. Yep. And that, that's not how we teach reading now, right? Like there is some of that, like, you know, there is some of it, like you're just practicing letter shapes and sounds, right? But there's also like you choose the books that are interesting to you. Yeah. Right. Because we want to build people who are in love with reading. Right. I, I don't know that in all cases we're doing that with music education. And I think GarageBand does this to some extent too, right? Like it's like a letting letting kids create music instead of just regurgitating <laughs> music. But like what what I what's hard about GarageBand is like it doesn't it doesn't give you the language for thinking about music theory. It just sort of lets you you can either play an instrument and you feel free to disagree with me, like or push back here. Like, you know, it gives me these these fancy musical instruments that like arpeggiate for me or play in a certain key or like, you know, like I can play chords automatically without having to think about it. And I can combine samples from different genres and like play around with different instruments. But I'm not sure it's sort of giving me a language for thinking about music theory, like how music works. And this is where I'm wondering about like, can code kind of be a language that lets us think about music theory? And I don't mean like the, again, like a really inaccessible version of music theory, just like right. kind of some of the basics of music theory. To kind of elaborate on what you're talking about for people who are not familiar with it, like I've done a lot of music theory, more than I'd like. And like my best friend has like a PhD in composition. And the way that he talks about music theory is that it's it was designed to analyze the end product and was not actually used to create that product. Mm. So music theory is not necessarily helpful for composing music as much as it is for understanding mm. a way of looking at how it sounds the way that it does. Mm. So it's more descriptive than it is a, a framework for creating. You can use certain aspects as a framework, but it's it's more describing. Like if you do a Schenkerian analysis, it's something that you'll like often learn in grad school. That is a type of music theory 
where it talks about tension and release in music mm. and how do the chord structures kind of all relate to this like big mm. building point and then have a climax and then some kind of release etc and it's a fascinating way of studying it but it really does nothing to make me a better composer <laughs> and it's not how i actually think when i do it so that it is that weird kind of is this useful for creating or is this useful for listening and understanding after the fact? Right. That's super fascinating. I hadn't heard that before. Like don't scales and keys and diatonic chords like give you a framework for creation of music? Those are more of like the letters and the words than it is like how the paragraphs work together. Like mm. it's, it's very rudimentary tools that you will use. And it, it's helpful, but it, it doesn't really encapsulate everything that goes on. Like when I write music, whether it's like percussive music that is not related to melody, harmony, etc., or it is, etc. Interesting. Yeah, that's super fascinating. I, I hadn't heard that perspective before. And, and it kind of does make a lot of sense. It's sort of like literary criticism as a tool for understanding and taking literature apart, but not yep. the act of writing literature and like experiencing a really good novel, right? Yep. Huh. Like we're not, we're very far away from where we want to be, but you know, like we introduce chord pretty early on and sort of like, and, and it's like, we shy away from a lot of the terminology and we're not teaching people how to like about keys and that sort of thing. But we are saying like, here are seven chords that, and here's the formula for making those chords, play around with the chords, find ones that sound good together to you. Yep. And then here's how you can put them into a piece of music and like, yep. you know, then, then it's like, okay, once you have your chords, here's how you can create an arpeggio, right? Like, and, and we we go pretty early on with that that kind of approach to sort of scaffold up the creation of, of pieces. I, 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 you know, I don't know how well it works yet, but that's that's been kind of our approach. Yeah, I, so I took a, a class during my master's that was learning how to compose in the style of different composers over the course of the last couple hundred years. And what oh, was fascinating is... We use music theory to analyze basically their patterns of musical discourse mm -hmm. and to try and figure out if I were to write in the style of Schubert, my chord structure might be like this, but if I were to write in the style of Beethoven, it would be like this instead. Yes. And then it was the variations from that framework to go, but Schubert would have had this kind of embellishment that is atypical than what Beethoven would have done, etc. So it was helpful for figuring that out. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you think so, but I'm a nerd when it comes to that. <laughs> <laughs> I think a, a big emphasis in music education oftentimes is to start with melody first. And we are very much like start with beat first, start with rhythm, start with percussion first. Yes, thank you. <laughs> because like, that's where the soul is. Yeah. Right. Then either do bass or harmony second, right? Like, so, and only at the very end do you think about melody. And I think that that reflects sort of broader trends in music right now is like kind of de-emphasizing melody. Yeah. So it's like more consistent with a lot of, a lot of the music that kids are familiar with. And also because it's like harder to code melody than it is to code, like say a chord progression, but also because like a melody, I think often, I mean, I know people start with melody a lot composition but to me like a melody kind of emerges out of the that intersection of the chords and the the beat that you're using and then the melody can kind of emerge out of that and you know anyway that that's kind of like the the direction that we're we're thinking about this yeah every composition i've done has been different in terms of sometimes i might start with one or another or like just piecemeal together or it all comes like there's no, here is how I come up with composition. It's just like writing a paper. I mean, like an academic paper, I, it's not like you start from the intro and then like work your way through it. Like there's so many different ways to go about it. So one of the, the things that I've really been fascinated with over time is like how people iterate on their abilities related to the things that they do in their career. So like your abilities as an educator or as a researcher or an author, etc. like how have you tried to either iterate on it or just like practice it to improve in those different areas? It's interesting. Like I came into academia from a computer science background. And one thing that I did not get at all was like formal training in social science research methods, right? So it's like, how do you conduct interviews? How do you analyze interviews? How do you collect field notes? How do you make sense of video data? And like, I just did not have that. And, you know, you kind of get thrown into a space where, you know, you need to be able to, like a researcher needs to be able to take data and learn from it in a way that's 
like that preserves integrity, right? Like that you you are honestly trying to learn from the data that you've collected. Um, this is like a typical like qualitative you know approach to research. That was something like I'm really fortunate to be at a place where I'm surrounded by like brilliant students, and I learn from them. You know, like kind of doing things together, learn from colleagues, read examples. But it's like definitely not so. It's just something you really have to work hard at. To, to learn and pushing myself as a writer like you know you read certain authors like well, i mean i think seymour papert is like a is an example right uh, uh or someone like don norman these are older examples but like or you know more recently like uh the work of nail and this year like there are certain authors that you read their work and you're just like wow they have you you start to recognize the craft of writing and like how how powerful they are as communicators of ideas and so you know just like drafts and drafts and drafts of like writing that I'll rip up and like you know iterate on and and sort of like developing writing as a discipline is something that just like and it, and it also gets you get rusty right as a writer just like you get rusty as a musician and um, you know so it just like it it involves practice and keeping sharp. Do you have a process for like the papers you write? I asked, like, as an example, one of my mentors had a process where, like, each day of the week, he would work on a different project. And so he would be, he would have five projects going on simultaneously. And it gave him th that incubation time so that on Monday, he only thought about that project for Monday. And then he had a whole week to think about it, even though he's working on other stuff. And then he'd come back to it. But then I had other professors and, like, myself where I just, like, go all in on one thing and just do that nonstop. And then when I finish that, move on to the next thing. Yeah, I'm definitely not that structured. Although I do I do sort of feel like I go through phases where like right now I'm in a software development phase or right now I'm in a curriculum development phase or right now I'm in a writing phase or right now I'm in a data analysis phase. And like you get really, you still have all of the other life things going on. So you can't like just throw yourself into it like, you know, you could as a grad student, but you get really annoyed when things are distracting you from like writing or like, you know, coding or whatever it is. But I do think there are times of day that like are good for, there's times of day that are good for writing. Like that's like morning. I write on paper. I write like I'll go on walks. Like I write really well when I'm, when I'm moving. So I'll go on walks with like, like a legal pad and a pen. And people think I'm some sort of random inspector and they get really like freaked <laughs> out that there's this like weird guy walking around like stopping and writing notes. But like that's how I that's how I write first drafts. And then like coding is something I do well at in the like afternoon, evening, like for whatever reason, meetings uh, mid afternoon, you know, so there's kind of like there's definitely like you find ways to impose structure when you can, but uh, you sort of have to or otherwise I think you're just responding to email all day. <laughs> right. Like no, no good for anyone. <laughs> Right, which you're you're definitely touching on the the next question that I want to ask like every guest, but like how do you prevent the burnout that can come with the pressures of like working as a scholar? I mean, I think it's just really hard. I see this, you know, happening like people just throw themselves into work like there's no other, you know, there's nothing else that's important in life. It's really hard because you can like if you're not actively trying to prevent it, like avoid it. Like our culture is just geared and it's not just academia, like I think it's any, you know, any number of different kinds of jobs that are just sort of geared up to burn you out as quickly as possible unless you are actively working to prevent it. And so like part of me is like kind of figuring out like there are things I really, really love about my job. I love teaching, love working with students. I love going into fifth grade classrooms. I really like writing when I can. You know, like it's, and so just recognizing the things that like really bring you joy, making sure that you have time to do those things, which, and, but it's hard. It's really hard to, uh, to avoid burnout. And yeah, I don't know. How do you avoid burnout? Oh, so many different approaches. It's one of the reasons why I ask like each guest is because I want to learn from them so I can figure it out. Like you were mentioning the the thinking time while walking. So I use the Pomodoro method where I'll work for 50 minutes, five, zero minutes, and then I'll take a 10 minute walking break where like I'll just be on my treadmill and I might listen to a podcast or listen to music or like play a video game because um, I have a, like a TV mounted on it. Things like that just to give me that time to move because I'm the kind of person where if I don't set an alarm, I won't stop working. And then I'll be like, oh, wow, I haven't eaten in a few hours and it's like dark outside and I didn't even realize uh -huh. that. <laughs> right. So there's that. There's just like setting very clear boundaries with like at this time of day, I'm going to stop working on this thing and like focus on like hanging out with my wife, etc. Yeah. Yeah. I have to be very structured. Like you'll notice while I was like in this conversation, I was drinking a liquid salad, like 
that makes it so that I don't have to sit down and eat. I can just like drink my lunch while having a conversation. Like things like this, just little things that make it so it saved me five, 10 minutes here or there. It all adds up in the end so that I can be more intentional with my time, my energy, my attention, et cetera, throughout the day. I don't think this is right, but I think that, that the burden of avoiding burnout is is on the individuals who are, you know, that it's rare that you find a job that structurally supports you and like mm. <laughs> not getting burnt out. And the also problem was like, if I just did what I was contractually obligated to do, I don't think I would feel burnt out, but I <laughs> love doing all of these other things and I throw myself into projects and yeah. like, and I think that that's the danger also of being a creative person yeah. is that, you know, we get excited about building things and doing things and creating things. And then like, and that's all on top of everything else. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't have good <laughs> solutions for you. What do you wish there's more research on that can inform your own practices? I mean, going back to the equity issue, right? Like in the inclusion issue, like I think we've been banging our heads against this wall for 40 years. And your your comments about sort of like colonialist tendencies is is real. And so when like when we talk about things like outreach programs, it very much assumes a, a framework in which we are being like, why aren't you coming to our party? Like we have a party going on. You should be here. Like, so come to our party, right? Like, we'll pay you to come to our party. Like, you know, yeah. and it's not acknowledging that like people maybe don't want to be in your, your, you know, your party. And, and, and of course, there's tons of great research going on in this, but I feel like I don't think we figured it out quite yet, at least not for computer science. I, if, if we're talking about if we're going back to CS education, like I think that's and so many, you know, like it's this thing that we were talking about before we started, where the minute you put something in school, it can be the coolest thing ever. But like the minute it's in, in a classroom and you're you have to do it, you're compelled to do it because the teacher said so we kill the not exclusively like they're great teachers that that. But there's, there's I think, a, a, for many kids in which CS for all movements, getting CS and, you know, CS as a graduation requirements, in many cases, that has done more harm than good in terms of getting people excited about computer science. And not exclusively, right? Like, I'm not talking about everything, but I think that there has been, you know, there harm done there. So, like, understanding, I think frameworks for understanding engagement are pretty lacking. I think that we, as computer science in particular, constructionism has been like a very prominent framework. Mm -hmm. And I I think constructionism does a great job of describing my own personal experience of computer science. I think it describes a fraction of its experiences with computer science and does not do a good job of describing the experience of many, many other students mm. and sort of having other frameworks that kind of help us understand. It can't be the only way that you develop a love of a field. There have to be other ways to go about it. And so I kind of kind of believe that we need to sort of have richer descriptions of trajectories and pathways. Yeah. In the learning sciences in particular, there's like, there's like people who really focus on like cognitive load theory and really focusing on like, what are the learning outcomes and, and and that side of thing. But then on the other end of the, pers the the spectrum is like educational psychologists who focus on motivation and things like that. And I think having that merger of the two would be beneficial. Yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's right. Yeah, uh, like, again, lo lo more longitudinal success stories, I think would be really, would, would be really valuable to have, you know, kind of, it's easy to look and, and I'm guilty of this too. It's like, we can evaluate a summer program and talk about the experience of kids in the summer program, but we don't know what happens to them the next year or the year after that or the year after that. Did this did this experience matter? And for whom did it matter? Yeah, that's more common practice for other domains. Like I've done a lot of grant reviews for like the Department of Education, and they have that data on here's our impact, not only for this semester, but like how students are doing five years from now. And like, that's fantastic, but there's just not enough of that when it comes to learning like a lot of that was related to some like other domain and we've successfully avoided saying artificial intelligence this entire interview but i do think <laughs> that that's like a big you know that's obviously a big question kind of going forward is like what are what are we trying to do if we're talking about you know sort of computer science education kind of re-examining like what are the goals here and why you know yeah i mean if five ten years from now you can just give verbal commands to a machine and it writes it for you like a program are we going to need to know the the day-to-day -day, like right. little details when i think in music it's a good example of like you know i can say hey compose something in this genre like you know this genre with 
you know, this kind of feeling and the machine creates a fully fleshed out, you know, three minute pop song that sounds amazing. Like, what is my motivation as a human being to engage in the, you know, creative process myself, right? Like, I I don't know how much I'm concerned about that, but I, you know, it does, yeah, just understanding motivation, like what, what level of fidelity do kids need to to sort of feel excited and proud and like want to explore deeper in their work. So very early on in the, this podcast, I, I did a little mini series on modding and mod culture. And one of the things that they, uh, one of the studies talked about was they found that students were more motivated, engaged, etc., when they were modding a video game rather than creating a video game from a blank slate. And I think that's going to happen with like just creating in general, it, not just in the arts, but like, hey, chat GPT-12, do this thing for me and I'm going to modify it to actually make it sound even better in the way that I want. But you're just going to get rid of the the boring work for me. But who knows? We'll see a decade from now. Yeah, no, that's actually really interesting. And we're certainly thinking about that in terms of music. And it's like, you know, like, can you give me pieces that I can modify and like, you know, customize and make my own? But I, I do wonder like, what the motivation structure is going to look like for her people. Yeah. What's something that you're working on that a listener might be able to help with? What comes to mind is you were mentioning like it's hard finding music educators. Like that could be a simple, hey, if you know music educators, reach out kind of a thing. If you're a music educator or, you know, or you know music educators, reach out. We have, you know, curriculum that we've been developing for several years that we're trying to get into like a form that we'll have online because it's like not really publicly available. And just working with educators, so like educators who are excited about you know, trying something that maybe is like a little different. I really, really believe in participatory design with, with teachers. I think it's like pretty much the only way to go. It's like when you're co-designing stuff, because I, I don't understand your needs as an educator. I don't understand fully the need, the trajectory of kids. Like I, I see, you know, the fifth graders I'm working with now, like I see them once a week for 40 minutes, right? I don't understand the broader context that they're living through day to day. And like, so just being able to partner with educators is like, a, it's really a, it's like something that gets me really excited. So yeah, that's a great e- example of kind of something that I'd be looking for. Do you have any questions for myself or to the field at large? So you've talked to tons of people. Like what's the thing that's like you're getting really excited about? When I first really started getting into CS education, it was like 2017 when I started doing it full time and kind of viewing myself as a CS educator. Like before that, I was just kind of dabbling in it as like an arts educator, music educator. I've seen a broadening of discourse where originally it was more like, here's what project-based learning is. Like very like introductory, like education 100 level course kind of discussions. But now, several years later, we're like really getting into, yeah, but what does representation look like? How does this like compare to other forms of addressing gaps in equity, etc.? Or... Um, What are the nuances with this pedagogical approach compared to other pedagogical approach? When would you use one over another, et cetera? I I feel like the field is is maturing more and is is starting to pull scholarship from other domains and actually looking at it in CS education. Because there has been a tendency, no offense to well-intentioned scholars, to kind of look at this from like a blank slate and to go, well, this is this new thing, a new subject area. And we're going to look at this and try and figure things out, as opposed to looking at other domains like math education, which has been around for a wee bit longer, and going, well, what are the the frameworks, the lenses, the things, the topics that they are using or exploring, discussing, and how might that inform our own work, et cetera? And I think those conversations are like becoming more commonplace. So we're getting more perspectives and more depth. And that like excites me to see that. That's awesome. Yeah. Are there any topics that we haven't asked or that i haven't asked that uh, you'd like to discuss we're kind of thinking about like elevating coding to performance art and there's been kind of like a, a sort of nascent live coding scene that's out there but you know my my real thing is like i want to i want to imagine like what would it look like to mash up a robotics competitions with a poetry slam and sort of create something completely new and different that's like yeah. kid teams teams of kids are coming up with their laptops and they're improvising you know musical performance using python code and like to sort of bring in the the cultural identity dimensions of poetry slams with the sort of technical engineering dimensions of robotics competitions and sort of like <laughs> imagine something completely different yeah that'd be fun but i have no idea how to accomplish that 
what it would look like. But, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I don't know if you've spoken to Sam Aaron, but like talking about the Algorave scene and all that, like get some ideas there. <laughs> I have not talked to Sam Aaron, but yeah, that that's kind of a genre shifted version of the Algorave scene would be would be really <laughs> exciting and interesting. Where might people go to connect with you and the organizations that you work with? People are always welcome to email me, or you can go to inpad.com and contact us through that. And I'm. I'm really excited to talk to people, so feel free to reach out. I'm on Twitter at Orn Michael. We'll include it in the, the thing, but that's virtually how to get all to me. And I'll make sure to include links to all of that in the show notes at jaredoleary.com. If you enjoyed this interview, consider sharing it with somebody else or simply leaving a review on whatever app you're listening to this on. It just helps more people find the free content that I create at jaredoleary.com. Stay tuned next week for another episode. Until then, I hope you're all staying safe and are having a wonderful week.